Hello, and welcome to episode one of the second season of the LCLC podcast. In our first season, I reviewed the storied 50-year history of the Louisville Conference on Literature and Culture, or the LCLC, a conference that began way back in 1972 at the University of Louisville. I'm your host, Matthew Biberman, and I decided to start this podcast after I was tapped to be the LCLC's new director in the summer of 2021. The second season exists as an aid for me as I work to ensure that the conference continues to remain relevant in the future for art, both in the short and in the long term. I do so in order to prepare for our upcoming momentous 50th conference slated to take place this February 2023. And looking further ahead, I also plan to engage with artists, writers, critics, and theorists who I see as doing important work, expanding the space for art beyond its current precarious location within academia. In this episode, I chat with Josh Hoink, who is a lecturer at Case Western Reserve and co-director of the Charles Olson Society. Josh is editor of the collection Staying Open, Charles Olson's Sources and Influences, Vernon Press, 2019. After thanking Josh and the other members of the Olson Society for committing to an impressive slate of three panels for our 50th conference, I began our conversation with the following question. At a time when pundits have ample evidence to declare poetry dead in America, the members of the Charles Olson Society seem committed to proving that poetry is alive and well in our country. Why, Josh, do you think Olson is such a significant figure today for enthusiasts of poetry in our country? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's an interesting question. So, I think in some ways, uh, well, you're, you're probably asking that question because of the article that was in the New York Times yesterday, in some ways, that had sort of, uh, that had sort of said that poetry was dead or something like that. And um, a bunch of my friends ended up, a bunch of my friend poets on Facebook had started sort of arguing about this or, or complaining about it. So I went and read that this morning. Um, and I don't know, it's a pretty bad article in general. But uh, one thing that, that kind of stood out to me as I was reading that article was that the 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 pundit more or less had kind of declared poetry dead based on this sort of faulty assumption that poetry somehow had to have to do with a, um, a sort of unmediated experience of nature or something like that. And there's all kinds of problems with that sort of bizarre position. Um, but it's also just a really sad kind of position to take in some ways. And I think that one thing about Charles Olson that sort of makes him significant now and it keeps a lot of us going in the society uh and this is sort of the simple part of the answer is that he had so much enthusiasm like as a person and as a poet for poetry writing in general um and it's that enthusiasm that a i think that that article and that the kind of pundits who declare poetry dead sort of lack um and so in my own in my own readings of olson I come across it all the time is that he's just such an effusive personality in some ways when he's when he's writing uh, about poetry. So one of the places you see that the most with Charles Olson is in his correspondence. And that's a that's a, a, a kind of area of his writing that I've studied a lot and that I think a lot of uh, people who work on Olson and who think about Olson continue to return to is that he would just get so enthusiastic about about writing. And not his own writing, too, sometimes. He'd be enthusiastic about certain ideas or about writings that other people had sent him. Um, a really good example is from the unpublished correspondence with Charles with uh, Robert Creeley from 1954. So uh, the way this works is that Robert Duncan, San Francisco poet, who was one of Olson's friends, had been writing this poem called The Poem Beginning with the Line um, by Pindar. And it's this kind of Pindaric ode that Duncan had been working on all throughout 1954. And he sends it to Olson, and then Olson sends this letter to Creeley where he's just like beaming, you know, basically saying, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Um, and, and it's a way of kind of talking about poetry that just you can see how excited he is about the things that Duncan's writing. 
Um, and so I think that, that enthusiasm that he has for poetry continues to attract a lot of us. Um, it's a thing that you certainly see in his correspondence. So when 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 folks read his correspondence, that kind of enthusiasm comes out. It's also something that you that you can come across in his teaching. Um, for those of us who are interested in Olson, not just as a poet, but Olson also as a teacher, um, his teaching absolutely was was kind of bonkers in a way. Um, there are reports of you know from things that he did at Black Mountain College where classes would go all night. And it's it's that's not made up. Most of the students all corroborate that is that the class, you know, they could start class around 7 p.m. after dinner and then the class would sort of end like at a tavern in town around 6 a.m. Um, some students, one of the one of his students had described watching one of his classes uh, as something like, how did she put it? Um, Francine Gray, she said that like it was like watching an archaeologist have a tantrum in a museum or something like that. That like he had this kind of like effusive sort of personality. Um, and so it's that excitement for poetry that that draws a lot of us together, I think, and that keeps a lot of us going when it comes to when it comes to talking about Olson. Um, and that's kind of a simple answer, answer, just that he's that he he brings a lot of excitement to the table. There are other reasons. One is that he's also a very difficult poet. Um, and and some and I do think that there's nothing wrong with difficulty. In fact, I think it's one of the great pleasures um, of 20th century poetic writing. You see it in these kind of you know these big texts, these big projects that other poets worked on, like Ezra Pound's Cantos or even say Joyce's Ulysses, where you have these texts that you can kind of get lost in in some ways. Um, you follow out the connections within the within the text or within the within the work, and there's a real pleasure to it. That, that it's something that you learn alongside um, the poems. There's never the same reading of Olson. Every time you open up the Maximus poems, you're always going to find something new or something different um, to think about. Uh, his, his, his thinking was amateurish in some ways, but it also ranged so widely as a result of that. So on, in one poem, you could be looking into the history of ancient Mesopotamia, um, and in the next in the next poem, you're somewhere stuck in in you know ninth century um, Islamic culture, you know Islamic angelology or mysticism or something like that, and then you're back in early colonial history within the next few lines. Um, so there's something I think that's pleasurable about kind of like following out those connections um, and learning how to read the work. It's the same kind of thing that happens when you read something like Joyce's Ulysses or Pound's Cantos. Um, or even some of the more complex, long poems that are being written today. So it's that difficulty and that that sense that it's always different um, that also helps. How long has the Olson Society been around? And who are some of the important players within the society that help keep it going? Yeah, the society has a has a bit of a strange history. Um, so it 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 started really, I think, in the nineties with uh, the scholar Ralph Maud. He had, he had sort of started an entity that was called the Charles Olson Society, I think in the early 90s. I don't exactly remember the date. What I do remember is that in graduate school, at some point I had Googled Charles Olson and this thing called the Minutes of the Charles Olson Society came up and it's a large website where Ralph had archived all these sorts of documents, remembrances, reviews of Olson's work. That website is still up. Um, Ralph passed on in 2014. So, you know, he, but he had stopped kind of adding to that, I believe in the early 2000s. But that, that website is still there and there's still a whole bunch of different kinds of biographical, um, autobiographical, you know, biographical and uh, essays and things like that on, on that. Um, that version of the Charles Olson Society, though, was somewhat different from the one that I'm sort of affiliated with now. Um, I, I wanna say that it was back about two decades ago that Gary Grieve Carlson, who's a professor at Lebanon Valley College, started sponsoring panels at the American Literature Association's annual meeting. And that was um, really where some academics started to get involved in something that looked like the academic Charles Olson Society. Um, mm -hmm. Gary had run those panels for years. I met Gary in 2008 when I was a when I was a graduate student. 
I gave my first paper for the Charles Wilson Society at the ALA in San Francisco. Gary's a great scholar. Um, his book, Poems Containing History, is like an awesome book. People should totally read it um, to think about the relationship between history and poetry. There's a lot of Olson in that book. Gary had been joined, I think, um, by my friend Jeff Gardner. Uh, and Jeff is sort of the, he's, he kind of continues to be the co-director of the society with me to this day. Jeff's a uh, San Francisco-based guy. He's an independent scholar. He studied with Sherman Paul, who's a, a great Olson scholar in the 70s and 80s. Um, and so Jeff had also run those panels with Gary. I think they kind of traded off year by year doing the ALA. Uh, and then I got, I got involved sort of more and more throughout 2008 and then into 2014 um, when Gary asked me to start sponsoring panels at the Louisville conference. And that was the first time that we started working with that conference as well. So I, I kind of took over as like an associate director at that point. So there's a lot of folks. So one thing that, that then happened in 2018 was that, well, no, sorry, in 2017 was that Jeff had started to talk with me about doing an edited collection of past conference papers that had been going on at the ALA for years. So we sort of started contacting a lot of people and put together an edited collection, which I edited called Staying Open, um, Charles Olson's Sources and Influences. And we had a lot of great, a lot of great young scholars contributed to that. Um, Michael Kindlin, who is uh, uh, a guy that I work uh, a scholar that I work with, he's based in Sheffield, wonderful guy. Um, Michael Jonick, another scholar who's based in the UK. Some younger people like Alex Ruggieri, who, who got his PhD from Tufts. Um, Nat Pree, who's, a, who's an Australian. Well, I think he's a German who lives in Australia. I can't even exactly remember where he's from. Anyway, he's our guy in Australia, but they all contributed to that. And it was at that point that Gary kind of stepped down and asked me to take over. So we've been doing conferences. Um, we've been doing three, we do three conferences a year. So we do the Reviewing Black Mountain College Conference in the fall in Asheville. Then we do the Louisville Conference with you guys um, in February. And then we continue to do the ALA. That always takes place on Memorial Day weekend. A few of the major people who continue to contribute conference after conference, poet Joe Safdie is always a regular um, and he's always uh, coming up with new and interesting essays about Olson and Olson's influence. Um, Joe's a wonderful poet too. His book Oregon Trail came out a couple of years ago. Great book. Uh, Jeff Davis is uh, is a poet who's always, uh, you know, up to contribute something to one of our panels and Jeff is a He's an Asheville based poet, so he runs a radio program down there too, which is a he's interviewed just tons and tons of different poets. Dale Smith's been participating a lot. He'll be back at Louisville this year. Um, so if, if, if you don't know Dale's book of latest book of poetry, Flying Red Horse, really, really interesting book. And then another guy who's always another scholar who's always sort of um, he comes to Asheville a lot is Joe Pizza. He has a book coming out with Iowa, but I can't exactly remember the title of it. Um, but it, it should be quite good. Uh, he writes a lot about Olson's influence um, on, on subsequent generations of African-American poets. And then we've also got a lot of younger folks who, who are starting to participate more and more. And I'd like to, you know, I hope in the future that we continue to sort of grow the society and get more young people involved in these three conferences that we do every year. Um, so there's a young scholar named Daniel Dominguez who's writing on Mackey's work at Princeton. He'll be on our panels this year at Louisville. Um, Devin Philbrick, he's a he's a poet scholar at Michigan, I think, um, who's also participated a bit, writes on Mackey. Um, Zane Koss just got his PhD from NYU. And then so, and then Stephen Williams, too, who's a poet um, living in Chicago. His book, Earth Enough, just came out. I hope I'm not missing anybody here, actually, too. Uh, just because there's a, there are a lot of people who come in and out, um, and I try to keep it as open as I as I you know as we can. Um, when I send out the calls for papers, it's just a huge listserv, and if anybody on that listserv is interested, generally that you know I just tell them, okay, send me something along, and we'll get you, we'll get you going. So, so the society is kind of like it started off in the '90s as one thing, and then sort of transformed and grew into something else in the early 2000s. Um, and my hope is just to keep growing the society and to keep getting more and more participants um, involved as we as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So at the upcoming Louisville conference, our 50th conference, a, a big milestone for us, you and 
your uh, collaborators here in the Olson Society of three panels. Um, what what is the is is there an overall arc to the three panels? What's the logic behind your uh, panels? Yeah, the um, well, the panels. So again, I I don't run the society in a kind of like um, sort of strict way. Like we don't have any bylaws or dues or anything like that. It's all very loose. So oftentimes, the number of panels and the number of participants is really just based on who contacts me after we send out the call for papers and how many people want to participate. This year we had 12 people um, who sort of came up with something, which was which was quite a lot. That's uh, the most we've ever had. In fact, I think last last year we had nine and we also separated that into three panels. So it was just a, it was just we had a, a really large response to the to the call for papers. There is an overall an overall logic and a kind of goal behind some of what we're doing as well. So I had been um, I correspond with Dale Smith, who I already mentioned, and we were talking about, well, what you know, what kind of call for papers should we do this year? What do you think? And Dale kind of came up with this concept um, called the way he the way he put it was that the title should be something along the lines of Olson Adrift reach of Black Mountain poetry. Um, I think in the back of Dale's mind, he had this poem from the end of the second Maximus volume, the short little poem that just says, I set out now in a box upon the sea. It's this image of, of Olson like in a small ship or Maximus in a small ship kind of drifting in the sea, basically. Um, and I think that Dale had thought about that and I had kind of thought alongside him about maybe this had we wanted to do something that would discuss Olson's influence. And not just Olson's influence, but also maybe the influence of other people who were in that sort of circle of the new American poetry or what we might call Black Mountain poetry. Um, and so in some ways, it's a bit of a continuation, but from a sort of reverse point of view from the first edited collection that the society did. So the edited collection that we put out in 20 in 2019 was called Staying Open, Charles Olson's Sources and Influences. And that book looks at the influences on Olson's poetics. So that covers Olson's pedagogy, the pedagogical influences, the musical influences, um, the philosophical influences, the, the influences of indigenous cultures on his poetry specifically. This sort of takes a look at at that same kind of question of influence, but from a sort of reverse perspective, where it's like, how did Olson or those poets in his circle influence um, subsequent generations or others, right? So why was projective verse important for, say, someone like Ed Dorn, or why was it important, or you know, how has Nathaniel Mackey sort of incorporated those theories and made them his own in his own poetry? Those kinds of questions were the questions that we wanted to ask. And I think that I think ultimately what I'd like to do is try to do another edited collection that'll be about the influence of Black Mountain poetry um, on other po poems and poets that emerged in the latter half of the 20th century. So right. Temporary. Uh, yeah. I see that and good luck with that project that the titles have uh, Ed Dorn in it, Jack Spicer. Nathaniel Mackey, Robert Duncan all immediately jumped out and looking over your uh, your panelists. Do you do you, are those surprises? Are those old familiar names in the constellation of Olson and his influence? Yeah, I think they're not. I mean, they're not totally surprises. What What's interesting to me, and I, I think what we're hope what I hope we get at with some of these panels um is really a way of thinking about influence through relationships that are that are complicated and that are complex and that have different kinds of um different kinds of uh features to them so i mean like if you think about olsen and dorn right like that's you're, you're going to be able to talk about one certain kind of model of influence there um dorn was olsen's student at black mountain college for many years so there's a teacher student relationship that's behind sort of the Olson Dorn, um, the Olson Dorn sort of poetic, basically. Um, and so that, you know, that that's gonna lead to sort of one kind of model of influence, I think, or at least it's gonna it's gonna raise questions about things like pedagogy, questions about 
teaching um, questions, different questions probably about voice too, just because Olson as a teacher was so um, obsessed with the idea that his students shouldn't write like him and that they should sort of find their own kind of voice and that their own sort of style. That's why they look very different in some ways. But then of course there's like Olson and Spicer. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised that that one's gonna be part of the lineup. But Olson and Spicer also didn't really get along very much. Um, if, if anything, that's probably something of an antagonistic relationship, which is still a kind of influence, right? To, to have someone who's a bit of a frenemy or, or even an enemy. I mean, there's still going to be influence that's exchanged there because, you know, Spicer is maybe reacting to something that he sees in Olson or trying to do something totally different. Than what than what Olson is doing, and 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 there's there are disagreements that happen um, between those two, so that's that's sort of an antagonistic model of influence. Um, is the only one we said? Oh, Mackie, yeah, yeah. You know, Mackie, Mackie kind of comes from a from a generation that's sort of after Olson in some ways. I mean, Mackie um, knew Robert Duncan, obviously, um, and and but still, I think that Mackie, you know, is removed from like sort of the direct experience of Olson, at least a little bit. Um, and I think of Mackey as a very different poet than Charles Olson, even though even though um, Mackey has, you know, sort of acknowledged that Olson had some influence on his poetics. You know, so it could be there's like a generational sort of influence that happens there, or also Mackey trying to sort of define himself in some ways against Olson. I mean, it, you know, I'll be interested to see what comes out of those papers. I think that's Daniel who's, who's writing on that, and he has some very interesting ideas because he brings a lot of theory to the table to uh, those papers. And then there's Duncan. I mean, and Duncan was Olson's friend, someone who Olson absolutely respected as a poet, but who he also disagreed with as a friend quite a bit. Um, so that's going to also sort of present, I think, a, a bit of a different sort of like relational model of influence as well. So I'm hoping we cover like a lot of these different sort of ways of coming at the question of influence, depending on the specific relationship that that those pairings might have. Um, I mean, my yeah. friend Pat Free actually is Australian. Or he's in Australia, and he's going to be writing about the influence that Olson has on Australian poetics. I know absolutely nothing about this, so you know, so uh, so there's there's some kind of international influence too, which I'm hoping you know that Matt will be able to sort of uncover for us um, in the papers. So I'm excited about it. We're actually going to repeat the topic at the ALA as well in May. So hopefully we'll get enough kind of papers together to where we can start to work them up into, into publishable articles. I was wondering if you, I, I see Olson as somewhat of a prophetic figure in pointing to a way for poetry to make a jump now. I don't necessarily agree uh, with the idea that poetry is dead now. Um, although I, I, that article made me think a little bit about one of the times I went to go see Seamus Heaney read in San Jose, which is, has, a, has a city sister relationship to Dublin. And it was in, in a large I want to say it was in like a large public amphitheater. There may there were thousands of people there. We we showed up late and ended up getting escorted to watch Heaney from the back of the stage. So I could see, you know, I could see at a whiskey bottle and a glass of water and a and a cup, you know, in, in the lectern underneath. Uh, while he was reading, and I was looking out as he was looking out over a, over a, a packed house of maybe two two thousand people or so. Um, I don't know if if we'll see uh, something quite like that in the near future, and I'm not sure how much necessarily we're going to see it um, ensconced in its parasitical relationship to the contemporary university as the university in America pivots to. STEM and, and absorbs all of these anxieties about how the humanities prepares you for a job. But the fact that poets need to find a new home, to me, doesn't necessarily mean the end of poetry, nor does it necessarily signal something bad. It's just another kind of turn of the screw. And Olson, 
strikes me as as being somebody that you would pack for that voyage. Um, what's your thoughts about Olson's utility as we go forward into the brave unknown? So again, I think that I mean I think that this question is is probably going to be the one that um, continues to show Olson's sort of usefulness uh, as we as we sort of move forward. And I think it'll be one of the, and I think it's one of the more interesting ways of kind of studying him as well. Uh, is and you know this has to do sort of somewhat with his his own relationship to the university as well or to the academia. Um, obviously, a lot of poetry comes out of academia now, out of MFA programs, um, a lot of award programs or awards, and you know that kind of culture is sort of linked up with with the academy now as well. And at the same time, you're right that a lot of um, universities are really de-emphasizing. The humanities and in some ways universities are becoming more like job training programs it's definitely happening at my own university um our english department has had has had real problems since i joined there um, i mean like i'm not tenure track but i joined i've been there for 13 years in that time we've lost 10 professors and only three have been replaced so our major in in a way barely even you know functions as it's supposed to so in some ways the 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 university is not, not the place, you know, not the place to sort of build kind of a thriving community um, for poetry. At least for me, it wouldn't be because it's a too much focused on this kind of like award culture thing. And then B, it's also, you know, the, the rigorous and systematic study of the discipline is being is being kind of eviscerated. Um, largely, as you said, in, in deference for hiring more STEM professors as opposed to humanities professors. I think Olson, Olson's anti-academic kind of stance fits in here really well. Um, one thing that's overlooked about Olson is that he was a working class person. You know, he was a working class boy when he grew up. He did not feel, you know, he, he won a scholarship to go to Wesleyan and, and he did not feel very comfortable there. He felt like he was a working class kid among the elite. Um, and he never liked the the sort of blue blood uh, sort of elite nature of the American university. In fact, he hated it. Couldn't stand it while he was at Harvard. He quit before he got his PhD um, and went off to, to work in the government. So I think that like, you know, he always had this antagonistic relationship to it, um, to the American university. So so when he got to Black Mountain College, you know, he kind of he kind of fit in there in some ways. And, it, and it's that legacy of Black Mountain College that, that's really important here. Um, the legacy of Black Mountain College is, for me, linked to Olson, largely because he was there for seven years. He also, it collapsed right as he was sort of there. He wasn't really responsible for the financial collapse of it. That had been sort of set up in the, in the late 40s and, and in 1950. But a lot of that fell into his lap. And so in some ways, he was trying to kind of hang on to the legacy of Black Mountain College, even as it fell apart. But Black Mountain College was a community that had almost nothing to do with uh, the kind of STEM university that we have today. It's, in fact, in some ways, completely the opposite. The school had no grades. It had, it had no required classes. Um, students had to design their own course of study. Uh, at the same time, it was incredibly rigorous because the students had to perform um, and, the, and the faculty were very demanding. Um, it was also a community where the faculty and the students openly fraternized. I mean, the, they, they ate together. It had this influence from the Bauhaus as being a kind of working community. There was a farm instead of sports, right? Like, that's this huge kind of like difference to the modern university where, you know, we celebrate these kind of like shows of athletic masculine like kind of culture on the weekends. Well, at Black Mountain College, you didn't have any of that. You had a farm, right, that everybody had to work together. And that was how you educated the hand. Um, those alternate models of education that Black Mountain College explored, they were flawed in some ways, but in, but in other ways, they're really exciting because they point to how you can make new communities with different rules and that they can actually work sometimes. Um, I don't know, I talk to my students about it because they see like the sticker for Black Mountain College on the back of my computer sometimes. And they say, well, what's that, you know, what's Black Mountain College? And I kind of describe these things to them and they're like, wow, that's, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, 
um, largely because it's so far outside of the kind of like programmed educations that they're getting. Olson was all about that kind of stuff. Um, he really he really thought that like educational anarchy had a value. Um, and so I think that I think that, you know, as as we study those sorts of the things that he did in the classroom, the things that he did at Black Mountain College and the legacies that he inherited through the school that found their way into his poetry, it'll help for for contemporary poets to start thinking about, you know, where how do we kind of make something that's outside of the university or that that doesn't have to participate um, in this highly commercialized, um, highly neoliberal and also like very like like uh, financially austere um, thing that the humanities have become uh, modern university. So I think it's I think it's going to be important to to look more and more at that sort of stuff. Um, I'm interested in writing about you know, about Black Mountain College just as much as I'm interested in writing about Olson. In fact, so anyway, I guess that's what I'd probably say about it. Any last uh, thoughts uh, before we wrap up this afternoon? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, you know, I'm looking forward to the conference this year. I can't, you know, it's the 50th anniversary and the, the society is really, really happy that we're able to bring 12 participants this year. Um, I think it's going to be a great time. I mean, I think this question about poetry being alive or dead is something that, that also is, is crucial to think about. Yeah, you know, I, I would. Anybody who thinks that poetry is dead really ought to come down to the Louisville conference um, in February and see what goes on there, because because there's an awful lot of great poets writing um, writing great poetry today. I mean, I think that article, one of the sort of other like bizarre assumptions that it made was that we're not really capable of writing great poetry, and this just struck me as being like as being almost tone deaf. It was kind of like, well, that you know, just. Was it just last year, like Nathaniel Mackey published Double Trio, Nathaniel Tarn like published uh, his his book Atlantis. I mean, there are some incredibly exciting things happening in in the world of um, experimental poetry today, and so it, it seems to me that we're actually living in a great time for poetry. Um, but you got to come down to the Louisville conference to to find some of it. I think. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed my conversation with Josh Hoink. If you have, hit like and subscribe. Also, consider telling a friend or writing a review of the podcast. And I invite you to join us for an upcoming conference. To learn more, consult thelouisvilleconference.com for details or reach out directly to me, Matthew Bipperman, LCLC Director. Thanks again for listening.